Hi, everyone. Um, so I uh, I'm basically want to share some, some closing thoughts. Um, I want to thank everybody for their engagement and participation, not just for coming, but for all the great questions and the conversations. Uh, this has been a, um, is, this, this type of gathering could not be more important to us, to all the researchers here and to IPA, um, to, our, to our funders, to all of our partners. You know, we, we, IPA started actually here in Peru. Um, back in, in 2002, this was our very first country where we had any, any projects. I was working with Edis Lanau here in the front um, from Finca Peru. And the goal of IPA, but um, the, the goal of IPA has always been two things. It's about understanding more about what works and what doesn't in the fight against poverty. And it's about bringing that lesson to the light of, to see the light of day and making sure that it's not just mere academic work that serves the academic purposes and kind of creates knowledge and creates knowledge for other people to then build off of. And, you know, I'm an academic, I'm kind of dorky in the end. So I, I you know, I, there are things I like pursuing because I find them intellectually curious and engaging. But at the end of the day, the, a lot of the researchers who you've heard present from here and who are in this space of this type of research, we got into this not because we're intellectually curious, but because there's problems in the world that we really saw uh, that academic research can actually help solve and actually can help provide guiding, guiding insights, which is a little bit different than a way a lot of economists, frankly, got to be doing what they're doing, which is through just being intellectually curious and seeing economics as an interesting toolkit where, where that fit with their kind of interests and view of the world. And so this, this world needs an or needed an organization 10 years ago 11 years ago, that had a mission that was not just about the production of the knowledge, which is a lot of what you've been seeing is all these studies that have been produced by IPA around the world and other groups around the world, but, but made sure that those lessons got, I, I, this thing is broken, I can't, uh, there we go. I was having problems scrolling down to the off button. It was just stuck, but now I did it. Um, and, and takes those lessons and brings them out. Now, in some situations, that is a fairly straightforward process of how to scale something up. Okay, there might be a, take one of our landmark programs is on deworming and provide and shows the, the benefits to, to education from helping children get rid of intestinal worms by giving them a very cheap pill. Right, and so there's a very straightforward, it takes a lot of work, but it is to, for it's pretty clear what the path forward is for scaling that up. We need to work through the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, and using school-based deworming programs is a good way of bringing that to the millions. But a lot of the things in the finance space, it's a little less clear sometimes how to scale that up. Because certainly it's outside the space of what we as an NGO would do, it's outside the space of what government would do, and, and it mixes in the for-profit incentives of many firms with the, the do-gooder incentives of figuring out what are the right policies to be doing. And so that's an area where conferences like this are absolutely critical, because ultimately it's not to be solved by just having a few meetings at the government and then having a top-down strategy, as, as has been done with deworming, where you can do, deworm the entire country of Kenya twice, which is what IPA has done with, in collaboration with the government. Right? That's not going to happen in the financial space. The financial space is going to, we're going to have that impact from this research on the way policy and practice takes place by having gatherings like this and seeing you know, many different financial institutions learning about these results and using it to help guide them and guide their thinking about what types of services they're providing. So that's, the, that's why these events are, are so um, exciting to us um, in order to be able to share these results and hopefully that you can see different insights and in how it shapes your thinking about the products and designs you want to do. But likewise, we, you know, we're, we're, actually, you know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg as far as we see it, and there's a lot of open questions. So the rest of this talk I'm going to give you, I'm going to present to kind of close up. I want to start off by just giving you some, a focused way of thinking about savings in particular, and I want to talk about three different things that we're looking to do that are in different, different um, pro points in the spectrum of research to scale up. Um, so that's the IP, um, sorry. So. When we talk about savings, it's very, we're very fast sometimes to talk about undersaving. And what do we mean by undersaving? Why, why, would someone not, why would someone not be saving optimally? So if we're trying, if we're offering people savings accounts, 
or they already have access to savings accounts, why is it that there's so much attention that you've been hearing here about across many presentations about how to get people to save more? What makes us think that they're not saving optimally to begin with? And it's very important sometimes to think about that because if you don't understand why the problem, why there is a problem in the first place, or even if there is a problem in the first place, it's very hard to think about whether the intervention is something that actually solves that problem per se. There's a, there's a little bit of a lure back to what Abhijit Banerjee was saying in his comments on the work with Comfort Hamos, that unless we have some, some clear model of understanding what makes people actually better off, it's really hard to think about what to, what, how to conclude from seeing that they did more of this and less of that. Is that good or bad? What, what, does this match some, does this make them better off? And so similarly, if we do something in savings and just see them save more, is that good or bad? Maybe they're over-saving now. Um, so what do we, when we mean under-saving, here's, here's a set of five categories of things that we're often thinking about when we're talking about an issue that actually would drive a wedge and lead someone to under-save. The first is transaction costs. This is the straightforward one. I talked about this briefly yesterday. I want to talk about one of the huge advantages of mobile, mobile money is about lowering the transaction cost. So maybe I don't save because it, it's an hour away to get to the local bank branch or the fees at the bank branch are too high. So I just don't, I don't, I can't save because, because they're not well suited to small savers. Two might be lack of trust or regulatory barriers. I want to save, but there's what we would call a moral hazard problem. I want to save, but I don't have a bank that I can trust to put my money in. Now maybe there are trustworthy banks, but I just don't trust them. And so that's a perception issue rather than a reality issue. Either way, it's a problem. And that means if that is what's the driving the wedge, it's leading people to not save as much as they could. Policies which help improve that, either through um, prudential policy, regulatory policy that helps, helps um, label to consumers which banks ha are safe and, and, and maintain safe banks so they don't go under and have bank runs. Or maybe it's merely about bank policies and bank marketing and figuring out how they can present themselves better to, to clients to, to convey the, the trust they have. So I'm just giving you examples. Information and knowledge gaps could be one. Maybe, maybe there's just a knowledge gap, a human capital gap. This is the, very much the motivation behind financial literacy interventions is the idea that it, that, it, that it costs a lot of money and time to get the lessons about how to manage finance and people are not willing to incur those costs. And so if we do things to subsidize the cost of acquiring better financial literacy, then people will then make better decisions. Social constraints, maybe I don't save because I, if anything I save, my, my spouse is gonna take. So like, what's the point? Um, and I don't like the things my spouse likes, right? That's important. If I like the things my spouse likes, then, then it's fine, it's all the same. But if I, anything I save is gonna go right to what my spouse wants to buy, which is of zero value to me, then that's a social constraint. No, it's not necessarily spouse. It could be the neighbor, it could be the children, it could be the parents, whatever. Um, and behavioral biases, these are like what I talked about yesterday about self-control and temptation. So these are, if you have an understanding of what that issue is, each one of those lessons gives you a very different policy prescription. So if we have some theoretical understanding that says we think undersaving is taking place because of one of these issues, social constraints, as an example, what's the policy implication? Figuring out some way of providing women their own account, in which they can keep private. That's the implication if social constraints with spousal bargaining is the constraint, right? So when you understand the source of the problem, it should often give you immediate guidance towards what the solution could be. And so that's why research which helps understand the source of the problem um, has, has much more legs to it when it comes to policy implications. So the overall process for IPA, whoops, um, is five steps, innovate, which we don't always get involved in. There's a lot of times, take the Compartamos paper that I shared with you. There was nothing innovative about that for us, right? We didn't, we didn't create the Compartamos model. I mean, they didn't even create the Compartamos model, right? They were, they were copying from other groups. I mean, they modified, right? But, um, so there's nothing innovative in that sketch, but we're identifying a question. So that needed answering in the evaluation phase. But there are many cases, and you heard about many of the projects here from other researchers, in which there was an innovation component that the researchers got involved in. So the first is kind of an optional part. Then is evaluate, replicate. This is an important step, and, and when we replicate, what we really mean here is kind of a theory-led replication and extension. That a lot of times we can start off with a project like the commitment savings work that I described um, that worked in one place, so great. Does that mean we should write policy all over the world? No. We need to have other replications in other contexts. We need to see that we're getting a consistent set of lessons in across the setting, across the world. The microcredit results 
that we shared and Abhijit um, referred to also how consistent they have been across other settings. And that's, that's reassuring from a, as a researcher perspective. When you get that type of consistency, it means that, we're, you know, that we, we feel more confident of the results, that it's not just, we're not, we're not over, overdoing policy implications from one result. Communicate, like we're doing today. And the scale. The scale and the communicate are obviously related, and depending on who the right vehicle is for scale up has very different implications, as I talked about. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about now is three different things that are in three different phases of this process. One is in the innovate phase, one is in the replicate phase, and one is in the scale phase, and all in the financial services. And all include some research. Just because something's in the scale phase doesn't mean we think it's outside of research, but it just means there's enough evidence behind it that we're comfortable saying this should be scaled up, but at the same time, alongside that scale up, there's important questions one can ask to help improve the way it's done. So first I'm going to talk about the innovate one. How am I doing on time? Half? 20 minutes left. Oh, I can start coasting. <laughs> Maybe I should talk slower. Am I talking too fast for people? Often I'm told that when I'm being translated. Often I'm told that, period. Um, but um, OK. OK, so the three things I'm going to talk about, one is in the innovate phase, one's in the replicate, one's in the scale phase. So there's a product in the United Kingdom. Actually, before I get to what the product is, I want to show that. I want to explain what the problem is. The, the heart of the problem, I think, is there's a, there's a pattern that not everybody but a lot of people engage in, simultaneous saving and borrowing. So. Think about your own finances. If you have, you know, I'm going to use numbers from the United States. Suppose in the United States, you, a credit card interest rate in the United States hovers between 18 to 30 percent, depending on your, your credit. Some are higher, but for the most part, 18 to 30 percent. There are people in the United States that will hold credit card debt, paying 18 to 30 percent, while also having money in a savings account that they're saving up for a vacation. In microcredit, a very common practice around the world is to be lending at rates like, you know, here in Peru, 70%, Mexico, like we talked about, 100%, while simultaneously encouraging people to save. Now, if you're holding interest rate, uh, holding debt at, you know, $300 of debt and paying 100% annually on that, on that debt, and you have an extra $100 sitting in a bank account. With, there are some exceptions to what I'm going to say, but they're just they're like little detail things. But for the most part, you'd be much better off just borrowing $200. Right? Take that $100 that you have in savings and borrow less. Then think about your interest cost for the year is $200 rather than $300. That's $100 of food on your table. But yet a lot of times micro lenders don't, do, don't encourage that. They don't encourage you to pay down the debt faster. They encourage you to create savings on the side. Right? And yet that's not the behavior that any financial advisor would ever give somebody in a moment in, if they're really doing what's in that, in that client's long-term best interest in terms of increasing consumption. That's the ultimate thing we all care about, is just increasing consumption of the household in, with some trade-offs between now and in the future, but that's ultimately what everything should be leading towards. And this is explicitly taking money that is going to the bank um, and putting it in someone's pocket for food, if you can show them how borrowing less is a form of saving. And that's actually much savvier than saving up while taking out high interest rate loans. So now there are some exceptions to the rule, particularly when credit is not very flexible. So if you can't borrow back down, like suppose that, those, that example I just gave you, you have a $300 debt and you have $100 in savings. And you pay off the debt, and now, and you want another loan. Do you borrow 300 or do you borrow 200 and pull out your 100 from savings? Right? Clearly, you pay, you're, it's better for you um, to, pay the, to take out the 100 from savings and take out the 200 from debt, and then you're only paying interest on $200. That's better than borrowing 300. But what if you want to have a little nest egg so that if an emergency happens, you can pull down another $100? Right? If that happens, 
And the lender who lends you 200 doesn't say to you, and by the way, if you ever want to get up to 300, you can do that too. You just come back to us and ask, and, and we'll give you another 100. If the lender is not willing to do that, if the lender doesn't have any flexibility in the way they lend, then it might be actually rational for the person to leave the 100 in the savings for the rainy day. That's a really expensive rainy day fund, though. Right? Why isn't the lender saying to them, no, 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 we'll give you the access to the 300 when you need, if you need it? That's clearly better for you, but you only need to borrow 200 now and don't borrow more than you need. Just le and you have 100 extra in your line of credit effectively to borrow down if a rainy day occurs. So it's clearly, it's unambiguously better for the client, a, set of, a situation like that. Right? Now, the reason it's not done in a lot of cases is potentially because it might not be profitable. Right? A bank makes a lot of, if a bank can manage to, it's, it's just a money pump from a bank's perspective in the short run. Now, the bank might actually be losing money in the long run because they're not doing what's best for the client. So in the long run, you know, they're not, they're not acting in the client's best interest. And if, if long-term best interest of the client does feed into long-term profits of the bank, then it's not even in the bank's long-term interest. But it's, in the short run, it's very clearly better for the bank because they're managing to take someone and borrow from them at 5% and lend back to them at 80%. Right? I will take that deal any day if anybody offered me to do that. Right? So, so that's the basic problem. And one of the challenges that we face is that is a psychological challenge. That people get comfort from having savings. Even if it's false savings, like I just described, where they took out a higher loan just be, in order to keep preserve savings, psychologically, that might give them comfort. So one of the solutions that we're trying to work with is to figure out, how can we give people that same psychological comfort that they still have this money in savings while doing what's actually in their best interest? So here's what has been tried a little bit in the UK, although the, the differential, the cost to the client from doing it wrong is much, much lower. So this is a much bigger issue in the microcredit space. So one of the reasons why I don't think these have, these are, these are fairly popular in the UK, but not every single person has one. And, and I think that's fundamentally just because the interest rates there, the wedge is very small, and so the cost to the client from doing it badly is not as steep. But the way the UK works is off of a mortgage, um, and you have a special savings account um, that is linked to your mortgage. And basically the way it works is if you want to save up in, a, in an education fund or a vacation fund, they give you that ability to have that separation, but really all that's happening is they're using it to pay down your mortgage faster. They're doing what's in your best interest. Um, and they're, they're taking the money in the savings, and rather than keep it in savings, they pay down the mortgage. Another way of thinking about it is that they pay, the interest they pay on your savings account is exactly the same interest you're paying them on your mortgage. So they net those out. Okay, and so, so this, this solves the, that, that problem in terms of from the client. They're only, the interest is paid only on the net balance. Now, the, you know, the obvious question is, does this generate enough client loyalty for the individuals that they are then, you know, with that bank forever, appreciative of the fact that this is a better service, bringing in other friends, bringing in colleagues, bringing in family, saying, you gotta work with this bank, and they're, they're really doing what's in our best interest. Um, they're, not, they're, not charging me, um, to, they're not charging me to lend back my own money to them, right? Um, so, so, this, so broadly thinking, you know, one way of thinking about this is that the standard question in, um, in, in, in financial services that we often hear from a bank's perspective is we have a product, how can we, what can we, you know, how can we sell this product? And it's not asking instead, what does the client really need? And if the answer is ever the client needs to save and borrow simultaneously, someone should be thinking harder about how, why is that really the case? Is that, is that really the case that someone should be doing both at the same time? What is going on in their life that that's really the answer and what's going on with the financial services? Because that's, that's probably not the right answer in terms of what's right for someone. And so instead, if the question is, um, if, the, if instead of being product oriented as financial services firms and instead we're client oriented and thought about individual and said, look, we're a bank, we're a financial service and we're here to work with you as an individual to provide whatever you need at that point in time. And at that point in time, maybe that's debt and maybe some other point in time it's savings, but we're here as your partner in the financial services world to figure out and help you figure out what you need at that point in time, rather than just saying, here's some products and we're trying to sell you them. Oh, and you, you've already bought two of our products, so let me, let me sell you some more, 
right? Because I've sold you some loans, that's great, so now you like us, now I'm going to sell you some savings products. And that's, that is the exact type approach that a lot of financial services have, um, and it leads to what is not optimal for the client. Okay, so the, the basic idea, and we're looking right now for partners to do this with, is someone who's a, a, a bank or financial that can take on both um, debt and savings clients, and is uh, and wants to test this approach of saying, look, we're going to charge you interest on your net balance, and you can have a positive or a negative. If it's a negative, then you owe us interest. If it's positive, we owe you interest because it's savings. We're going to charge you on the net balance, but we're going to we're going to we're going to present this to you as your portfolio, and we're going to give you. A, uh, a feeling of, of savings, even if you're in debt, by, by pointing out to you how much money and liquidity we're willing to give you in the case of an emergency. And so now you have your nest egg. Or maybe it's an education that you're saving up for. And so by letting you know how much slack you have in terms of liquidity, that's effectively the same as savings. So it's all about the way it's presented, is the short of it, the way your portfolio is presented. And the question we want to know is, can we do two things? Can we present the portfolio in a way that is psychologically appealing to people who want the comfort of savings without actually having to engage in the, in the money pump? And secondly, is it profitable in the long run for the bank? Because the bank does have to then walk away from in a bank was making short-term profits on this. And a bank has to say, we're going to give up those short-term profits in the long-term interest of the client. And so that's a question. Is there a long-term positive trade-off um, for the bank from doing this? OK, so that's the innovative one. These are open questions. Could be, you know, maybe the reason this product doesn't exist is because it's not going to be profitable. But we haven't really seen it, it, it tried, and, and certainly not seen it tried in this type of setting. And so we're quite keen to find a partner for that. Um, replicate. So we heard earlier about reminders to, to save. One of the things that's striking about um, the reminder study, we did one here with Caja de Ica. In, um, is anybody here from Caja de Ica? No. Um, in, um, we did one with Caja de Ica, one in the Philippines, um, and one in Bolivia, where we did very simple text messaging to remind people to save. And we found that that had a huge increase relative to the cost of a text message. It was, the, the increase was um, you know, 3 to 6% increases in, in savings, which is you know, small but large when you compare it to the cost of a text message. Um, and, but in some sense, well, as excited we, as we were by these results, um, they whet our appetite far more than they answered our questions. Because there's so much that could be learned about what exactly is the is, the, is happening when, it, when a message is sent. Is it, a, is it informative? Is it the fact that the bank is actually providing information to people that they didn't otherwise have that changes their behavior? Information about the importance of savings, information about goals that they could be saving for that they had not um, been aware of. Is it the case that we're actually changing their preferences in a bit or changing social norms by a bit or they're learning? They don't know how, how to make certain trade-offs, they're not sure what to think about it, and they, but they, this bank, which they do trust, gives them information and they say, okay, these people seem to know something about savings, I will take their advice. Or it could just be about attention, right? That there was, it wasn't that, I, I, knew, I knew I needed to save, and I just keep forgetting every day to do it, um, and just other things come up. But getting this text message, put it on the top of my mind, and then I became more likely to save. Or maybe I forget about my future expenses, or some of them. And so getting messages that remind me about the future expenses that I have reminds me that I need to save more. So these are some of the mechanisms that we want to get at. And so one of the things that we're now embarking on is a replication exercise, where we're aiming to first start off with a more clearly defined set of all of the questions that can be asked. And the beautiful thing about text messaging, as we all know, is that it can be done on mass scale and it's really, really cheap. And so our goal here is not to go work with one financial service firm and, s and have a sample of 10,000 people and send out some text messages, but to work with many financial services firm and see what's, which lessons are, tr are being transported successfully and which ones are not. And the goal at the end of the day is to actually have effectively like a white paper and a unit that can then work with new financial services firms and say, look, we've done 147 of these. It's not to say we, everything is, you know, can be predicted with um, perfection, but here are some clear lessons that are rising up, and, and these are the types of messaging that you can use in your context with your clients, given your product design, given who your clients are, that is more effective in helping them reach their goals in terms of their relationship with their bank. 
Um, we're actually in the process, we literally are just starting this set of replications together, and we're still actually looking to um, hire the, the director or coordinator or manager of this initiative. So that, that's, in other words, a job announcement. If anybody's interested in, in um, doing that, the job posting is on the IPA website. Um, but if you are interested in that, you should um, stop me or Aishwarya or Benny or Pooja or any one of the people. Who else is here? Angela? I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm omitting someone. My apologies. Um, Dylan, um, Adam, any one of us, um, and get more of a debriefing if you would be interested in, in that position. Okay, so then, um, scale up. So the commitment savings work, you've heard now a fair amount about from different presentations. And this is, you know, we always get asked this in policy settings, uh, not just in financial, across all the space. When is enough? How many times do you have to see a result uh, before you're comfortable getting outside of your researcher role in life and speaking with the government, speaking with a donor and saying, do this? Um, and I never know what to answer with that. It's, always, it's a tough question. But you know, there's two things that, uh, that, we, that we want to see when to, have that, to be able to have that confidence. One is we want some sense that it's been observed in more than one place. You know, is two enough, three, four? That I have a very hard time answering. Um, I do know that the world should not stop while researchers figure it all out. That's a bad world, right? So, and I know that one is more than zero, and two is more than one, and three is more than two, and four is more than three, and I could go on and fill up the rest of the five minutes with that if you don't know where that's going. Um, so, now with commitment savings, we're up to about half a dozen different studies that have shown um, positive impacts in different ways on different people, rolled out in different ways. To me, that's strong evidence that suggests that this clearly has a lot of legs to it. It's not been done in multiple contexts, but a lot more is needed to understand how to roll this out, how to, how to, how to market it, how to make sure that the right people get it, how to make sure, for instance, that it's not being done for people who are in high interest rate debt, and that if that's the case, that the, the best thing that they need to be encouraged to do is to figure out if, if they have slack cash that, that is excess and they're looking for someone to somewhere to park it, that they should be parking it back to the lender who's lending to them and paying down their debt faster. Right, so that would be a case if we rolled out commitment savings that it could actually be bad for people if, they, if it's keeping them in high interest rate debt um, and then they accumulate some other account over here that's locked in. Um, so these are all questions that we have that do impact how it's scaled up, but the consistent evidence across the context and the theory, that's the second thing. I said there's two things you need. You need, you need some, some, some replication, some start at replication, and you need theory. You need a theory to, uh, to be, that's, that's clear that says here's a basic problem, like the six stories that I told in the beginning. Um, here's something that, that theoretically addresses those issues, and here's evidence that shows that, in fact, this does solve some of those issues. And that is basically what we have seen now with the commitment savings. There are some clear theories about time and consistency that, that has strong evidence around the world, and commitment savings to devices are designed around that, and we have seen that link exactly take place um, in terms of who participates, et cetera. And so that's the context in which we are now working to start a, the scale-up process that's linked in with further research. Um, so, um, and you know, so as part of this process, it's, it's a question of doing hands-on technical assistance, um, active policy outreach, such as events like this, and putting together practitioner toolkits that um, likewise are able to show small financial services companies or large ones, um, you know, basic steps in how to implement uh, accounts of this nature. But there's many questions that remain that I think are really important. So this is now to the, to the researchers and also to the practitioners out there um, intended to be a list to kind of whet your appetite for some of the things that one could learn in the scale up if they, if they wish to. You know, what is the optimal level of commitment savings? I talked about this the other day, about how, how strongly should you be tying the hands of the person, is another way of thinking about that. Um, what is the evidence of where the money comes from? This goes to that debt question I mentioned, right? Does it come from debt? Does it come from other savings? This has important implications for whether we think of this as welfare enhancing or just a device that somehow is moving money around. Um, and so, you know, with that, what is the actual mechanism through which this enhances welfare? And this partly goes back to one of the points Abhijit made. If the account is getting it so that they, that they eat fewer beans and now have a TV, 
Is that good or bad? Well, it's a change. They chose to do it, so I like to think it's good. But there are some things that we might imagine being bad in that case, that there's later regrets. So we do need better work to understand that question that Abhijit posed. How do we actually think about the welfare of changes of that nature? Um, and there are some things which we will maybe are paternalistic and will say, well, you know, better health is important. So we're going to be paternalistic and say we prefer health to TVs. Um, but that, that requires either paternalism or some, um, or, or some other measures that one is using or some assumptions. Um, how do you set up the actual commitment features? Focusing on deposits, focusing on the withdrawal, withdrawals, or focusing on spending certain items. So with this as well, we're looking for partners. And actually, we don't have the job posting yet, but we will have a job posting soon for looking for people to work on this, on this scale-up initiative. We're, we're very early in this phase of designing what the initiative is going to look like, um, raising funding for it, and, and starting the scale-up process. Um, but, we, but we do have the, the funds that we do have available that many of you are aware of through City Foundation and through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation do have funds that are, are, um, that are available for application to do research on commitment savings. So we're looking for financial institutions that are interested in participating in the design, rolling out new products, working on figuring out how to target new and existing customers with these types of products, and of course evaluating that work. Um, and one of the purposes of events like this, as the matchmaking event that we had two days ago, was specifically targeted around trying to get researchers interested in questions of this nature to meet up with financial institutions. And, and like, like I said, then we have these two pots, um, initiative pots, that allow you know, individuals to competitively um, propose ideas that then get allocated to research on these topics. Um, so with that, I will, I will close. Thank you.